Hello and welcome to Let's Play Malkin with me, Bragaton. Malkin is both developed and published by Zach Holbrook. He not only developed and published it, he designed, wrote, illustrated, and scored the game. It was released on November 17th, 2023, and it is a hand-drawn, atmospheric, tactical RPG. Let's jump into a new game and see where this adventure takes us. Welcome to Character Creation. Click Build Suggestions to open the Quick Start Guide and to review some solid character builds for your first game. Click on the ability abbreviations, strength, dexterity, and so on to learn more about ability scores. Click the portrait and token to customize your character's appearance on the character sheet and on maps. Strength determines how frequently a character successfully hits enemies with melee attacks, and how much damage these attacks do. It sometimes confers an advantage in certain narrated events. If the young witch has swordplay, you should consider putting at least 4 points in strength. Dexterity determines how frequently a character successfully hits enemies with bows and how much damage these attacks do. The bonus of initiative affects a character's armor class, reflex, and initiative. Any witch who knows woodcraft should have at least 4 points of dexterity if they want to use bows. The bonus of constitution is directly applied to the young witch's fortitude saves and starting hit points. Every time the character gains a level, the constitution bonus is added to the character's total hit points along with the standard plus one from leveling up. Some spells use hit points or have effects that can damage the witch if they fail a fortitude save. Consider putting at least four points in constitution if you want to rely on these spells. The bonus from intelligence affects a character's will saves and maximum spell points. I assume that's what SP is. Uh, the resource used to cast spells. Every time the character gains a level, the intelligence bonus is added to the character's total spell points, along with the standard plus one from leveling up. Any witch who plans on using spells frequently, and you are a witch after all, should put at least four points in intelligence. The Laura's natural philosophy and folk magic use wisdom to help determine success in narrated encounters. Wisdom affects how much spell points the young witch receives when destroying elf candles, an enemy that appears in many combats. Charisma affects how much experience the party receives from quests and battles. It affects how much currency they lose or gain when interacting with the game's only merchant. Consider raising charisma if you want to level up quickly or to invest in gear and consumables. Well, I'm going to go with strength. We'll put that at 16. I do like gear, so we'll put that at 14, and I think. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So we change our name. We're going to go with Donald. Cycle. Okay. A witch is attuned to one of the four seasons or the yearly cycle itself. Mechanically, attunement works similarly to race selection in other games. It affects ability scores and resistances. So Summer gave us another two strength. The fall gave us two intelligence. Looks like we lost wisdom and dexterity. Winter gave us... I think I'm going to go with summer, because I do like my strength. And then what I can do... I don't like negative modifiers. So maybe a point less into charisma and put that to wisdom. The summer gives us, it looks like, plus two to charisma and plus two to strength, minus one to intelligence and wisdom. And then falls minus one is strength, plus two intelligence and wisdom. 
a minus one in constitution. Maybe I do winter. It is my favorite season. We have minus one to charisma here, though. We get plus two to wisdom, which I don't. I feel like I need. I'd rather have that point. Let's do one less than the constitution and put it into dexterity. We would have a negative modifier. Yeah, we'll stick with that. I'll right, select what sort of witch we are. Uh, let's go back to Witch of the Red Candle. Uh, so Witch of the Red Candle lowers natural philosophy, folk magic. Unique hex, minus four fortitude for seven rounds. The play style, magical attacks, debuffing enemies, and item use. I haven't looked down here. Does the seasons affect that? Yeah, it has to, right? We have 5% cold resist and we're winner. And 5% magic resist. Uh, spring gives us 5% electricity and poison resist. Summer is electricity and fire. Fall is acid and cold. Cool. And there's more witch types. My second time through, right? Alright, Witch of the Tower. Uh, Lores are warding a natural philosophy. Unique Hex, minus 2 attack bonus, and minus 50% electricity resistance for 7 rounds. A playstyle magical attacks, resilience, and item use. Witch of the Cairn. Lores hauntings and folk magic. Unique Hex, minus 8 will for 7 rounds, 2 hit points. I assume that means it costs 2 hit points? A playstyle magical attacks, debuffing enemies, and summoning. Which of the crossroads? Lores hauntings and warding. Unique hex, paralysis for one round, two hit points, cooldown one. Playstyle summoning, debuffing and controlling enemies, and resilience. Which of the pale blade? Lores hauntings and sword play. I'm already leaning towards this one. A unique hex, summon a spectral sword, four hit points, 75% normal resistance, plus two attack bonus, as an ally for two rounds, and I guess it costs two hit points. A playstyle summoning and melee attacks. Witch of the Urn. Lores hauntings and natural philosophy. Unique hex minus 100% acid resistance for 7 rounds. Playstyle summoning, magical attacks, and item use. A Witch of the Yew Tree. Lores hauntings and woodcraft. Unique hex minus 100% poison resistance for 7 rounds. Playstyle summoning and range attacks. Let's change our core stats too. A Witch of the Bitter Root. Lores Woodcraft and Natural Philosophy. Unique Hex, minus 50% Elemental Resistances and minus 2 Reflex for 7 rounds. Playstyle, Range and Magical Attacks, Debuffing Enemies and Item Use. Witch of the Black Blade. Lores Swordplay and Folk Magic. Unique Hex, minus 4 Armor Class for 7 rounds. Playstyle, Melee and Magical Attacks, Debuffing Enemies. Witch of the Bonfire. Lore's Woodcraft and Warding. Unique Hex, minus 2 attack bonus, minus 2 armor class, and minus 2 reflex for 7 rounds. Playstyle, range and magical attacks, resilience. Witch of the Cask. Lore's are swordplay and warding. Unique Hex, minus 6 attack bonus for 7 rounds. Playstyle, melee and magical attacks, and resilience. That's also the highest hit point start that we've seen, right? Witch of the Circle. Lores, Warding, and Folk Magic. Unique Hex, minus one movement for seven rounds. Playstyle, Magical Attacks, Resilience, Debuffing Enemies. Witch of the Court. Lores, Swordplay, and Natural Philosophy. Unique Hex, minus 50% Normal Resistance for seven rounds. Playstyle, Melee and Magical Attacks, Debuffing Enemies, and Item Use. Witch of the Dread Hunt. Lores, Swordplay, and Woodcraft. Unique Hex, 1 normal damage, ongoing for 7 rounds. Playstyle, melee, range, and magical attacks. Sounds interesting too. So this one or one of the blade witches. Witch of the Heath. 
Lores, Woodcraft, and Folk Magic. Unique Hex, minus 4 Reflex for 7 rounds. Playstyle, Ranged and Magical Attacks, Debuffing Enemies. And back to Witch of the Red Candle. I think I'm going to go with uh, Witch of the Pale Blade. We get a summon. And it is a turn-based game, where turn economy is king. I don't think it's much... Let me see. Uh, Black Blade. Yeah, a little bit more hit points with Witch of the Black Blade. I think since we also have the winter a season as our cycle, I'm going to lean into that and go with Witch of the Pale Blade. Oh, that's neat. I like this art style too. It's very... Tarot card. And a couple of them, their outfits actually changed. Not the first one, which is the one I'm leaning towards because you can see the armor on them. Like this guy down here, he's got a cloak there. Looks like a something with a hood. Maybe it's just the winner one that changes. I find that a little odd. We don't have all the seasons represented, right? That's probably summer, winter, and spring. There's no fall background. I uh, will go with winter because, again, that's our season. Whoops. And we'll go with the hood. And it's a white hood, so it matches our current theme anyway. Okay, so starting out, we have 16 strength with a plus 3 modifier, a 9 dexterity, 12 constitution with a plus 1 modifier, 10 intelligence, a 12 wisdom with a plus 1 modifier. I guess I can do one less into charisma and instead put it into dexterity just to round it out. And it feels weird not playing with charisma, right? Let's get a plus one modifier. I like the minus one that we get here, but it's fine. We'll, we'll make it work, right? All right, and we start with the 15 hit points, six spell points. Attack capabilities, attack bonus one times melee to hit, damage four over three. A range to hit one. Defenses, armor class 10, reflex one, will one, and fortitude two. And we have 5% magic and cold resistance. Choose one spell, you can learn more later. Oh, neat. Okay. Let's look through these. Uh, Flush of Youth. I'm not going to read the keywords, just the effects and I guess the poems at the bottom. That's cool. All right, so Flush of Youth heals 1 to 4 hit points, recovers 1 to 4 spell points, minus 4 will, minus 50% physical and acid resistance. Debuffs last for 3 rounds. In the Flush of Youth, I would sing for meaning. Heart's order attached to love like ivy. Now if I sing, I sing for mere joy, touching the most inevitable things. Everything and nothing holding fast. Chalice of Night. Two cold damage, caster will be injured. Plus three wisdom for three rounds, restores two spell points, removes shaken status effect. Apart from the feasters, the ash in the pit. Of fleshly mirth all spent. I'd be inhuman, a tree silhouette of longing against whole January. Boundlessness tipped out for me in a hall of stars. Might not have fit in perceiving vessel, O oh night. Treble Treble. Affects a 3x3 three three area. 3 poison and 3 fire damage. Base 50% chance of doing full damage. A fortitude poison and reflex fire modifies. Minus 3 weapon damage. Base 50% chance of working. Will modifies last 3 rounds. Treble Treble Dole or Dole. Fire Leap and Potion Roll. Slice of Life into it Throw. Panacea Common Woe. Platitude and Long Cliché. All the things that people say. Add no adder, drop no dog. Neglect the newt, forget the frog. The cauldron needeth not such stuff. Living is hell broth enough. Leap of the Black Deer. Plus two movement for three rounds. 
removes immobility. I really like that, especially as a more melee-inclined character. A charge into the understory, dark as night, tell the story, tell it right. Take nothing back, make it black. End of night, make it black. Wayfarer's Song heals 8 to 15 hit points. I should be looking at the cost too, because I only have, I think, 6 spell points. So these cost nothing. Alright, back to Wayfarer's Song. Hey ho, the world is unkind. Hey ho, the wind and rain. Hey ho, a city of strangers. No roof, no bread, no kin. No kin, no roof, no bread. Lock of Hair. Summons a very weak 2 hit point minion with minus 8 attack bonus who does 1 to 2 normal damage. Lasts for 4 rounds or until destroyed. <laughs> really setting that rabbit up for failure. Here is where there was a hair. A hair of hair, my hair of hair. There is where that hair went bare, and left you there, my hair of hair. Long I sought you, hair of hair, here I brought you, hair of hair. Hair's true heir, I claim my share. My lock of hair, my lock of hair. I really like the, the style of these spells. they very witchy. Uh, Wild Daughter's Valediction. Minus 8 armor class for 2 rounds works automatically. The hunt is on, and I will ride, but after hunt no more. I'll kill the hound without a sound. I'll mount the stag, grow old a hag. I'll ride the wild boar. The Garden of Sick Thought. Affects a 3x3 area. 2-8 to eight acid damage, base 80% chance of doing full damage. Will modifies. 2 acid damage for 3 rounds or until a successful fortitude save. Base 65% chance of persisting. Fortitude modifies. There's a blighted rose within that time will never touch. Feed it with regret and sin. Feed it overmuch. Let it flourish where it rots. Nourish it with dreadful thoughts. Let its tendrils spread and root, and your heart will bear its fruit. Home through Call Hollow. Affects a 7x7 seven seven area. Minus 3 attack bonus, minus 3 damage from weapon attacks. Works automatically. Lasts for 3 rounds. So I'm guessing works automatically means there's not a save against it, where if we look at the Garden of Sick Thought, will modifies means that their will can negate it. But works automatically, I guess, is a guaranteed effect. Don't you go there, bat and swallow. Don't you go there in the night. Something's wrong, and cold call hollow. Something's wrong, and won't come right. Now, I'm sure that the guide that's available on the main menu would uh, explain some of the, this stuff a little better. The Bristling of the Firecat. Summons a strong 8 hit point minion with plus 6 attack bonus who does 5 to 7 fire damage. Lasts for 3 rounds. I like that one. But we can't afford the spell cost. We only have six. Nothing burns like fire at night, and the seer it loves. See it bristling red and white, kindling as it goes. Fire cat, fire cat, pass by my house. The said burn down my foes. I did say we can learn spells later, so I will keep an eye out for the bristling of the fire cat. I'm not going to take it at the beginning because we can't cast it. A bread and butter. Four electricity damage works automatically. Bread and butter, I would mutter, if the void was winking. Mutter, mutter, bread and butter, lo, the void is gaping. Refoil's Rhyme. Summons a weak four hit point minion with a plus zero attack bonus who does one to four poison damage. It can heal allies three hit points with the spell Morning Dew. Range three, three by three area. Last for the next three turns of the caster. And the clover there she sings, and the clover underneath. Lover, lover with her wings. Lover, lover with her teeth. The Possum and the Virgin. Summons a weak 4 hit point minion with plus 2 attack bonus who does 3 to 4 acid damage. Lasts for 3 rounds or until destroyed. My crown is gone, the Possum cried. I still have mine, said she. You can't fool me, the Possum said. It is a forgery. All crowns are forged, the Virgin laughed. And purity is too. But blood is not, the Possum wept. His head was split in two. Yeah, some of these poems are really fun. Mask of Seven Colors. So it does 2 to 3 acid, poison, cold, magic, fire, and electricity damage. Each one has a 35% base chance of working. And then acid and poison is affected by fortitude. Cold and magic is affected by will. And fire and electricity is affected by reflex. And 2 normal damage works automatically. 
Color, color, cover me. Flesh is dull, so cover me. Flesh droops down while color flies. Color laughs and covers me. Along an icy path. Effects align, 1 by 2 in front of caster. 3 to 5 cold damage. Base 60% chance of doing full damage. Fortitude modifies. Minus 1 movement. Base 50% chance of working. A reflex modifies. Debuff lasts until enemy makes a successful reflex save. She went along an icy path, cut between her love and wrath. Frozen woods on either side, putting faulty, width not wide. I may select that just lean into the, like, the ice witch that I'm kind of creating as we go. I'm also tempted to get one of these summons. Blood Fever. Affects the 3x3 area with caster in the center. Caster will be injured. 3 to 5 fire damage, base 65% chance of doing full damage. Fortitude modifies. He coughed up blood for Daisy bled, and blood was in his brain. His bed was red. His nurse was done. She let him fade, far better dead. The storm blasted Heath. Affects a 5x5 area. 6 electricity damage. Base 50% chance of working. Reflex modifies. 6 cold damage. Base 40% chance of doing full damage. Fortitude modifies. Bring me closer to the cloud bank's heart. The darkest part. The darkest part. I am luckless, born to perish, but the thunder I can cherish. La Belle Dame Sans Mercy. I butchered the pronunciation of that. Affects a 3x3 area. Minus 100% fire resistance and cold resistance works automatically. Minus 8 will, reflex, fortitude, and armor class works automatically. Lasts for 2 rounds. That is a significant debuff. Guess is 4. But I want more. So she said to me. I gave her five, just half alive. Of these she took but three. Red Fox in the Snow. Four cold damage. Base 45% chance of doing full damage. Fortitude modifies. Three to five fire damage. Base 55% chance of doing full damage. Will modifies. Enemy is incapable of movement or action for one round. Will modifies. A trist of red and white, and white was glad of bed. A pale blue flew after. The fox already fled. Ballad of the Jays. Affects a 3x3 area. 4 to 5 cold damage. Base 75% chance of doing full damage. Fortitude modifies. Minus 4 attack bonus for 3 rounds. Base 55% chance of working. Will modifies. Debuff lasts for 3 rounds. Harsh, harsh cry. Clash and crackling. Chase and starling. Jaybird's cackling. Pretty sleep, pretty slumber. Affects a 3x3 area. Enemy is incapable of movement or action. Base 50% chance of working. Will modifies. Lasts for 3 rounds until the enemy takes damage. Pretty sleep, pretty slumber. Summer's coming, only child. Wild, wild child. Seek the shade tree. Wild, wild child. Willows shade thee. Only child, older child. Summer's over. Summer's over. And Meg, she gave them sucker. Affects a 3x3 area, heals 5 to 8 hit points. And Meg would cry, Come in, come in. Come in and drink this tea. Its blending is a mystery. Its taste is also mystery. What is memory? What is sweet memory? Warm your blood if it grows cold. Ballad of the Frogs. That sounds fun. Affects a 3x3 area, 4 to 5 poison damage, base 70% chance of doing full damage, will modifies. Minus 4 Reflex works automatically. Debuff lasts for 3 rounds. Burst not, burst not, belly throated. Sing and sing, but burst not. Oh, there's blood on the dim June highway. But burst not, burst not, belly throated. And all these are grayed out. Oh, because we start with this one. I guess maybe we start with all of these. So Hex of the Pale Blade. Unique Hex for Witches of the Pale Blade. Caster will be injured. I think it had a 2 hit point cost. Uh, summons a weak 4 hit point minion with plus 2 attack bonus total, who does 2 to 7 normal damage. Lasts for 2 rounds. Prick my finger, little crow. Fly the pain unto my foe. Multiply in stormy skies. Raise the murder. Cry your cries. And secrets of the stolen blade. Plus 3 attack bonus for 3 rounds. Witch and knight together lay to the hilt they played. 
but the son of the witch arose and carried off his blade. Wicked Ant Costs 9 hit points. Summons a minion with plus 5 attack bonus total, who uses his sword and knows the sword playability. Last until slain. Unique. If the caster casts a spell while Wicked Ant is already active, the active Wicked Ant will be destroyed. Oh, is that saying that the other summons we can have multiples of? Interesting. Here she comes, a soldier's blade, all blood red in her hand. She's finished most of us by now. She'll finish whom she can. I bore the sword and wore the colors of my father's clan. She'll take the things of him who fought, the things of him who ran. I always thought I'd die in war, in combat, man to man, and never dreamed to die the prey of wicked, wicked Anne. The Sweets of Fairyland. Affects a 5x5 area, deals 3-4 to four hit points, minus 4 will works automatically, minus 50% poison resistance works automatically. Debuff lasts until the end of the caster's next turn. Marzipan and Honeyed Claw, Purple Juice and Luscious Cheeks, Root of Sugar, Lemon Jaw, Syrup's Blood on Candied Chief. While I'm leaning towards Leap of the Black Deer, or something like Along an Icy Path for the thematics. This could also be good. It costs... Oh, we don't have enough uh, spell points, right? I'm pretty sure I only have seven. I'll just go back and look. I think if I'm going with a melee build, this might be the way to go. A little pricey. But I hate being crowd controlled, so I think I'm going to go with Leap of the Black Deer. And again, we can learn spells later. I'm going to lean towards some more summon spells, especially this one. When I can afford it. I mean, this one only costs three spell points. Let's get more self buffs. I'm gonna go with the Leap of the Black Deer. It's very costly though, I think. Seven questions. And there's the music. Alright, select what seems most suitable. Alternatively, review the effects of each answer in the Young Witch's Guidebook. Make selections by pressing the corresponding number on the keyboard. You can also use the mouse. How would you describe Donald's birth? I do believe that my birth is unremarkable. Though of note, my mother didn't make a single sound when I was being born. Not for any reason that I know of, Just she just didn't. So, unremarkable. It was easy, the midwife reported to the miller's wife. As pretty a natural a birth as can be. Mother and child both healthy. What kind of child was Donal? I did daydream a lot. I also read a lot. And I also didn't break any rules, at least until mid to late teens. I'm gonna go with literate and studious. I don't think I know what your Donal looks like, the Miller once remarked to his father. He always has his face in a book. My own boys aren't even lettered, you know. But maybe there's some good in it, he concluded doubtfully. He developed new interests as he grew up. What was one of them? Um, I guess I did a fair bit of exploring as a kid. I have done some poetry before, but I wouldn't say I was very good at it. I haven't done any weaving. I, I tried to draw as a kid, but I was also terrible at that. I think friendship is a safe choice. Uh, once the village elder knocked on the door with Donald at his side. Here he is. Found him with Waya, the herder's daughter, Grackle, that's Kenig's boy, and Grackle's little brother. They weren't causing trouble, just chattering and waiting at the sheepfold for the sun to rise. 
I told him sunrise wouldn't be for a few hours, that there might be better times to see it. What vocation appealed to Donald early on? Well, I was in the military, though early on it never even considered it. I've been an apprentice before. Never done any farming. I've gone to college. I wanted to go to college my entire childhood, so I'll probably select that. And I've never been a midwife. So, university education. We leave his house behind. Emily across the fields with Zadun's war and Proskusi, or Caxi primer in hand. Sometimes he sit beneath the miller's willow tree till he heard the curfew bell. Others saw his studies idleness, but Donald's mind had never been more active. Then, in the summer of his 14th year, Donald fell in love for the first time. He saw someone he had never seen before leading a pony through the overgrown orchard at the edge of town. Who was it? What were they doing there? Donald approached the stranger, unsure what he was going to say, but knowing he had to say something. Donald's memories of that conversation, the day and night that followed, would be a source of pain and sweetness for a long time. The lovers hoped to see each other again, someday, and made many promises that they would. They never did, however, and soon things began to change for Donald. When did he discover his witchcraft? I don't know. Maybe at 11, when he was invited to Hogwarts? Um, I'll just go with the middle option, I have no idea. Uh, at 16. He was just beginning to understand himself. He began having visions. He would find himself chanting odd little rhymes that came to him from nowhere. A childhood enemy woke up with his hair singed and brown mucus gluing his shut his eyes. Donna knew that he'd done it, but didn't know how. People started to say he was unlucky to be around. One day, a crow flew into or to his window, then it flew into his room. After that, it never left his side. And that wasn't all. When dusk fell, Donald sometimes imagined he saw a woman watching him from far away. It was strange. He knew everyone in town, but not her. He always felt dizzy when this happened. I wonder if that's Wicked Anne. The summon that we start with. Well, that's creepy. Now, once before sunrise, he woke and briefly saw the woman's silhouette at the end of his bed. He felt exhausted and nauseous. He recalled the stories of Wicked Anne. A murderess hanged years ago. Now a ghost who haunted the quiet roads outside town. Was this her? Soon, Wicked Anne, if that's who she was, was everywhere, sliding out of sight before Donald could get a good look, always leaving him queasy and spent. Then a ghastly revelation. He could make her appear just by thinking about her. Why did Donald leave the village? Good question. Uh, social ostracism? A friends and neighbors kept whispering. Fonzie taken for granted disintegrated. Only his mother continued to treat him kindly. The talk of the town was a burden to the poor woman, but she didn't let it show. But Donald wouldn't let things go on like that. What did Donald take with him? You can't beat a good walking stick. Blackthorn staff received. He grabbed his favorite walking stick from the corner where it rested. Where would it rest next? Where would he rest next? Donald had been on the road a day. He had no home, and no friend except the crow on his shoulder. That was when he heard the coven's call and had the vision. A witch slain, a coven strangely incomplete and more, shapes shrouded and inscrutable, that loomed in his mind like mountains in the dark. Welcome to Malkin. You're about to begin the game's tutorial. The tutorial covers basic controls and mechanics. If you have experience with CRPGs, most of this will be familiar. But Malkin has some unusual features the tutorials covers too. All right, so that's just our chat log.
Alright. The character sheet can be useful simply for checking a character's statistics and other information. But it's also used to equip items and to level up. To equip items, click on the slot of the item you'd like to equip, and select an item from the list of items that appears. This can be done in combat with weapons, but doing so costs you a turn. If you've gained enough experience to level up, a plus sign appears on your character's portrait, and a level up button appears on the character sheet. I'll actually start with this companion. His name is Pharaoh. He's a dexterity, and he's somewhat wise. Armor class is far better than ours at 18. Right, so I guess he throws kernels. Let me inspect them. Trying both left click and right click. There we go. Click on info down here. So, Blackthorn Staff, two handed melee weapon, not a young witch. I guess that's who can equip it. No more versus armor class, buff, status, movement minus one. Plus one, all defenses, two to four normal damage, plus strength, bonus of up to three. 10% critical hit chance. The critical hits double damage. Has a base 60% chance of reducing target's movement by 1. Fortitude modifies. Longsword does 1 to 6 normal damage, plus strength bonus of up to 3. 10% critical hit chance. And a dagger. Minus 1 straight, plus 1 attack bonus, 1 to 3 normal damage, strength bonus only goes up to 2. 10% critical hit chance. That's right, the staff is a two-handed weapon, but can equip an item in offhand while using a two-handed weapon. Unequip the two-handed weapon from the main hand first. Can't use ammo with the weapon currently equipped in your main hand. Robes of the Young Witch. Plus three armor class. Oh yeah, what does he have over here? Oh wow, 30% resistance to everything. Clicking on the bust icon brings you to the character sheet. To equip an item, select the icon where the item would be worn or carried. For instance, hats go on heads. <laughs> click the body icon to equip the robes. To equip a weapon, click the main hand icon while the young witch is, in the, is the active party member. And click it again to select a weapon. You can also click the info button to get more detailed information about the objects you've equipped. Any questions? Uh, what are some other things I can do on the character sheet? When it's time to level up, a level up notification appears on your portrait, and a level up button appears on the character sheet. You can also review the spells and lores you have via the spells and lores buttons. Besides that, there's not much to do on the character sheet. It's more informative than interactive. Anything else? Why can't the crow equip any items? Your companions can't use as much equipment as you can. To see who can use what, Check the item keywords using the info button. Anything else? Uh, what is the other hand for? Two-handed weapons, shields, and rare other objects might require a free other hand. Anything else? Uh, I think that's it. All items you find during the game are stored here. Right click on an item to interact with it or to learn more about it. Some items can be used directly from the inventory during combat. Blue Flask, a kind of healing potion, is one such item. Other important items are the map of the woods and the notebook. The map lets you see where you are and travel quickly from one place to another. The notebook lets you review basic info about the game or consult the guidebook via PDF. 
You can view other items like clothing and weapons here too, but to equip them you have to use the character sheet. That's a blue flask, range of 5 and heals 15 hit points. The Colonels, ammunition for Pharaoh's attacks only, 2 poison damage. Throws Curse, target suffers minus 4 armor class, minus 4 fortitude, minus 4 reflex, and minus 4 will for 1 round. Alright. Joe Pieweed. A flower found in a field. The young witch had felt compelled to pick it. The inventory shows all the party's items, both equipped and unequipped. Right click on an item or use the info button to learn more about it. Right click on an item to use it. Do this in combat to benefit from healing potions and other consumables. To equip an item, you must make use of the character sheet, not the inventory. Can I use items while not in combat? One of the most important items in the game, the map of the woods, is used via the inventory screen. The notebook is yet another item that can be used in this way. Both are items you'll receive once the game proper begins. Most other items can't be used outside combat. Anything else? Can I use this Joe Pie weed for anything? You'll sometimes find items that don't have any obvious use. This doesn't mean they're useless. In games, as in life, it's best to hold on to everything that comes your way, just in case. Sounds like a hoarder's mentality. Anything else? Uh, when I click the info button, I don't understand what I see. It's not true, but... I know, there's a lot to take in. Looking at an example like the Young Witch's Dagger might help, but knowing this info isn't essential. But I want to know. Tell me about the dagger. Alright, I've seen this before. Now the phrases at the top, melee weapon, young witch only, normal versus armor class, buff, debuff, are keywords that multiple items share. They tell you that the dagger is a melee weapon, that only Donald can use it, that it does normal, non-magical damage to enemies if it can overcome their armor class, that it both benefits and penalizes the wielder. Lots of items share these traits. The list below the keywords is more specific. Alright, so the debuff that's listed there is a debuff for the character, not the enemy. Alright, go on. First, the description says that the dagger gives a minus one strength penalty and a plus one attack bonus. When it comes to hitting and damaging enemies, it's a mixed bag. Next, it says that the dagger de does one to three normal damage with an additional plus two if the wielder's strength is high enough. In other words, a strong character could, on a normal hit, do up to 5 damage. Finally, the dagger has a 10% chance of critically hitting an opponent. If it lands such a hit, it does triple damage. I thought I said double damage. If you're familiar with D20 RPGs, it's worth glancing at armor and weapon profiles because they might be different from what you're used to. Anything else? Well, that's it. Uh, so stationary, no spot, no sneak through, does not move. Combat is played on a grid-based map. You can move the camera around the combat map with the arrow keys, not the WASD keys. Characters attack using weapons they have equipped and spells they know. Attack using the attack button and selecting the target. Unless you're using a bow or a spell, you have to move into melee range of the target to hit it. That means you have to stand next to it. If you want to use a spell, click this button. Experiment with your magic. Even a fighting witch needs spells. When aiming at distant targets with spells or bows, you might find that UI elements get in the way. To hide the UI, press X. So that's a useful bit of information Information I wouldn't have gotten if I didn't read the tutorial. If you can't do anything useful with your turn after moving, click this button. Sometimes, instead of skipping your turn, you might want to delay it. This is especially useful when someone who hasn't moved is blocking you. To delay, press L. It'll take your turn at the end of the combat round. 
In most combats, your crow can damage and debuff enemies with automatic poisonous hits. The tutorial target is immune to damage from Pharaoh's attacks, though. For combat, text boxes like this will give you helpful tips. Attack the target until you have done at least 3 points of damage. It is immune to poison, so Pharaoh's attacks won't hurt it. And most encounters are resolved by either entering a portal or destroying all enemies on the map. Before you destroy the target, visit some of the other locations on the map for more info. Uh, so we moved twice. And that's it. I mean, I bother moving Pharaoh. You cannot move as freely in combat as you can while exploring. Most creatures can only move can move only two squares. Diagonal and adjacent movement are calculated the same way. Positioning is very important in combat. And to the small mound nearby. This guy? Higher ground plus four attack bonus. You've reached higher ground. The exclamation point on this tile means that occupying it produces a certain effect. In this case, plus four attack bonus. Right click on your character to view this effect and others, including permanent effects like those from your responses to the seven questions. Hovering over a terrain square before moving, there will tell you what effect it has. Speaking of, what do we have? Alright, so background we have plus one intelligence, minus one fortitude, and minus one reflex. Is that great? Uh, plus one charisma, I guess that was for friendship. And then uh, plus one intelligence, minus one charisma. I'm really hurting my charisma. Uh, background, plus one spell point, minus one hit point. And then plus one wisdom, plus one will, minus 5% acid resistance. Blue flask received. Alright, so the crow can pick up stuff. Now, many combats have treasure chests. Treasure chests always have something good inside. They're not always so easy to get, too. Uh, this is an elf candle. It does nothing in this combat. In most combats, it supports your enemies by giving them spell points. The young witch should make destroying it a priority. It helps them recover some of their own spell points when they do. Young Witch Prevails A many games would congratulate you at this point, but should the same word used for births, weddings, and graduations be used for Donald's victory over an unmoving target? <laughs> uh, combat was too slow. How do I increase the speed? This toggle in the lower left hand corner of the screen adjusts attack speed. There are four different speeds. Experiment until you find the setting you like. I recommend double attack speed. Another toggle in the lower left hand corner of the screen adjusts movement speed. There are four different speeds. Experiment until you find the setting you like. I recommend double movement speed. Anything else? Uh, how should I prepare for real combat? Tip 1. In most combats there are two paths to victory. Destroying all your enemies, and 2. Occupying a certain tile. The first option is often harder and more resource intensive than the second. Tip 2. Most combats contain a single powerful enemy with a devastating range attack. That attack powers up slowly, but elf candles increase the rate at which it does. Destroying them quickly should be high on your list of things to do. Tip 3. Make use of consumables and try to bring as many as you can into battles, especially ones you know, you'll, know will be hard. Consumables can be used on companions at range, some allies can also use them. Tip 4. Don't forget to use your magic, including your hex and signature spells. Take advantage of Pharaoh's powerful attack and debuff combo. Remember that if UI elements cover up a target of a spell or other ranged attack, press X to hide the UI while targeting. Tip 5. Keep moving. Battlefield position is everything, and victory tiles and other rewards are often far from your start position. 
Remember that you can delay your turn by pressing L. This sometimes lets you move to a better position that you could have earlier in the round. A moving away from an enemy does invite an attack from them, but moving one square while in melee doesn't... I'm sorry, melee contact doesn't, as long as the new square is also in melee contact. So there are attacks of opportunity. Now, anything else? Where do I get the stats of the combatants? You can always review your ally stats via the character sheet. You can also hover over both enemies and allies with the mouse pointer to reveal uh, combat stats, which we saw with the target that we fought. A right clicking on the creature reveals permanent and temporary effects too. Alright, I guess that's it. Alright, only quest is the tutorial. Now, the young witch was eager to meet the witches of the coven. It wouldn't be long now. Right, I'll worry about saving later. You've completed the tutorial. I still have questions. I'll forget everything. There's more comprehensive information in the Young Witch's Guidebook. You can view the guidebook now if you wish, or later via the notebook item you'll soon receive. <laughs> but you guys know me. I don't like to read. Are you sure this is the game for you? <laughs> uh, reading is fine. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, reading is fun, but I don't like reading manuals. <laughs> Sorry, I started laughing too hard. If you want to revisit any of the conversations from the tutorial instead of reading the guidebook, you can use the notebook to do that too. Well, all right. I'm going to call it here. Next time, we'll jump into the game proper. We got through character creation and the tutorial. And so we kind of have an idea what we're in for. I think we're also... No, that's right. I think I lost the hit point from one of my background choices, right? I thought I was supposed to have 15. Well, either way, I'm going to call it here, and uh, next time we'll jump into the game proper. It's a really charming game. I'm enjoying it so far, so I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes. But for now, thanks for watching. I will see you guys in the next one.